today. So the big thing I want to start off with is the types of clay that we use. All right, so here we have an earthenware. This is your basic terracotta. Uh, usually it's a Lizella clay. Uh, this stuff I detest. I personally don't like it myself. It's just not a good clay for me to use. Uh, but this is actually great for doing construction builds. We're actually building something like a house or slab project. We'll get into that in just a second. In the middle here, we have our basic low fire clay. This is a uh, 0406 medium body clay. What I like about this is it burns perfectly white when it's done. So at, when it comes out of the kiln, it looks nice and bright white like this. Good for good for glaze application. But this is a low fire clay, whereas this is a terracotta. All right, then we're up to the high fire clay, which is the, this is the butter clay, that's what we like to call this stuff. Uh, the butter clay is a high fire clay only. We put this into the kiln, take it up to cone six, not cone 06. Uh, this one fires about 1900 degrees, whereas this one fires up closer to 2300 degrees. Uh, two, three, zero, zero, 20, 2000, over 2000 degrees. So nice and hot. All right, so, a couple of things we need to talk about with these clays, with this terracotta, the low fire and the high fire clay, is what can we do with these? What are the three basic things that we can build? All right, so you have three basic things and techniques that you do when you're working with clay. Number one is a pinch pot, and I'll do that with the low fire clay because it makes it easier. All right, so I'm going to take just a glob of this clay here, roll it up into a ball in my hand. Now the pinch technique is where you plug your thumb down in the middle and you pinch and rotate around. And you're just simply doing a, you're pinching the clay together to make the form, hence why it's called a pinch pot. Uh, it's being pinched into that shape. Now as I'm pinching, I'm doing light, slight pinch, slight roll, uh, but just pressing the clay out, forming it in my hands to create that cup or bowl shape. Um, simple pinch pot. Using the low fire clay, what we're going to do is we're going to do a uh, coil technique. So taking again another knob of clay, taking just a smaller, rolling out a little sausage in between, start it in between with your hands just like so, uh, using the whole hand. Now when you put it on the board, I'm using primarily the palm of my hand, some of the fingers, but that's once it's actually gotten out, I'm just kind of make it all even. All right, so let me put the crap off to the side. All right, sliding it down. Notice how I'm rolling, using my hand, slide it back and forth. Uh, now when I'm rolling, I need to use two hands. I glide them from the middle out like this. It helps to give it a more uniform shape. Just try and find the excess pieces, what parts are a little thick, what parts are a little thin. There's a flat coil. If I roll this up to make a spiral design, just rolling one piece over the other. Now let's talk about some plasticity. What's plasticity? Plasticity is the how much you can stretch some clay. So why I like this instead of this? Well, when I'm doing something like this, I don't have all this crack, this crumble bit. Now these, these clays are about the same um, moist, wet quality. Uh, they've both been in our clay recycle buckets, so they're good clay to use, they're fine to use, you can use them. But the gray clay stretches better. Case in point, so I got this coil, everything worked out. You saw me roll it out real easy, real nicely. I'm gonna use the terracotta clay, do the same exact thing. Now, as I'm rolling it out, I'm already starting to see some cracking along this. Now, the reason that's a big factor is because of the plasticity of the clay, how far I can stretch it, how far can I pull this clay apart to make it do what I want it to do. So as I roll this one around, now, both of them do the exact same thing. However, this clay has to be a lot more wet to make it actually to run the coils. And then when I go to smooth it, uh, it's just not going to have nearly as much stretch as the gray clay. It's just a clay body thing. Uh, plasticity in this clay is just more superior to the Lizella. So when you're working with clay, make sure that you know the plasticity of it, so how far you can stretch that clay out so that you can do the stuff that you want to do. All right, next thing going to use some of this white clay to make some slabs. Well, what's a slab? Well, you have a couple ways you can do this. You can take a rolling pin, roll these things out uh, to where you have a stretch of clay. Looks like a uh, cutting board, pretty much. Uh, that's how I make my tiles. I just roll out a slab of clay, 
cut it out to the tile form that I want to do, unless I want to do a super big tile like this, where I have to put feet on the back of it to do my painting pieces. Um, but it all base, bases off the same principle. So it's rolling out a thin sheet of clay uh, to where you can uh, attach different things to it. You can build with it. Top building my little houses. Um, but slab is just rolling out that stretch of clay to where you can build something much easier. Build your walls, build your shapes a lot easier with slab clay. All right, so in clay, a couple things we got to talk about. Um, you have three different levels of the clay. So this is your raw greenware. Uh, actually, technically, before anything's fired the first time, before it goes into the bisque firing, it is all greenware because it is green, it's still fresh, I can use it. Uh, I can take this piece of bone dry clay, toss it in the recycle bucket, make some new clay out of it, and it works just fine. However, if I was to take this piece or this piece, which have been bisque fired, these pieces, if I toss them in water, they'll just sit there. They're not gonna do anything because all of the physical water has been baked out. Actually, all the chemical water has been baked out of it. The physical water that makes this squishy has dried out of this, causing it to be a bone dry clay. Now, let's work backwards from there. All right, so these pieces have sat up for a minute or so. They're starting to dry out some, and as they start to dry out, they go to the second phase. The second phase is leather hard. The reason it's called leather hard is because it's it's still moves a little bit like leather, but it will hold its shape more so. It'll, hold, it'll stand up on its side and not fall apart, whereas you know, some, some clay, a fresh piece of clay will fall apart real bad. Um, leather hard stage is kind of the best stage to work with, especially if you're using slabs. I roll it out a slab, let it firm up for a little bit, then I can cut, shape it, mold it, do everything I need to do with it, but it holds its shape so the house won't fall down. Now, the or first wear is your raw. This is when it is best to just pull this out of the clay bucket, toss it on the wheel head, uh, start building with it, start doing your preliminary pieces. That's the best time to work with clay uh, to do a lot of things. We're going to have to stretch it. Full plasticity is when you have raw clay. Leather hard, not so much plasticity. It doesn't stretch so much. Good for building at that point. Bone dry, ooh, need to be very, very delicate with this because if you're not, it'll break into a million pieces. So. Bone dry, most fragile, leather hard, best to work with. Green or raw is when it is the freshest, perfect clay to take out and start building and working with. All right. Now, after we have one firing down, our bisque firing, the second thing that we're going to go to is our glazing technique. We'll get to that in just a second. Let's real quickly talk about while we're working with clay, what do we need to do? All right, so one of the big things that... Uh, most people kind of have an argument about is when you have to use slip. Now what is slip? Slip is this uh, mayonnaise goopy consistency that resides in this little cup here and all this is is some taking some clay, put some water in it, makes this wet clay mash, uh, mayonnaise can kind of consistency and this is our binder glue when we, when we have to uh, join two pieces together. All right, so right here, you can see that this is some fresh and raw clay. All I'm doing is I'm taking this bit of clay here and just gonna start stretching it. Just roll it out in some sausages, use some coil pieces. All right, so if I've taken this clay, this is a, uh, this is what we like to call Monday to Wednesday clay. All right, and what that process is, is this is Monday, I'm working on this one day, and taking my clay and I can join these two pieces together just equally okay Monday to Monday clay all works the same same day same time all right now let's say this is Wednesday clay all right this stuff has been sitting out for some time well this time I don't necessarily want to add Mon Wednesday clay to Monday clay why because this clay has dried out it's not the same moisture content anymore this might be almost a leather hard consistency as this is the raw consistency so what do I have to do I need to add slip in between so what I'm going to use is one of my handy dandy little throwing tools this one's got some little teeth on it and I'm going to scratch that top surface to create a um, basically like a, a grip system like this. And what that does is when I've scratched along that surface, I can then take my slip, I've got another slip right here, notice how this is the gray, this is the white because this is a different clay. Um, I can take some of my slip right here, so this you know mayonnaise consistency, 
paint it on around the around the piece like so. Move it so you guys can see. All right, paint it around the edge just like so. Doo -doo -doo. Then I can take my new, my new clay and I can add it on top. Well, if this clay has more water than this clay, but you put this watery stuff in between, is this not going to mess it up? Not really. What I'm doing is I'm creating a mash. So all I've done is I've scratched away the top surface of that clay. I've put this really loose watery clay in between it. And now this stuff will all become the same water level. So when I add on that fresh clay on top, they'll all lock together and work as one jointed piece. It just helps make sure that it doesn't crack, bend, break, anything of that nasty nature. Everything works together just as fine. Make sense? All right, class, the next thing we're gonna talk about is wedging. So why do we have to wedge? Well, the wedging is so that you can take air that's inside of this clay out before you start putting it on the kiln. Uh, sorry, before you start putting it on the wheel. All right, so for wedging, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my clay, take my cutter, whoop, cut this piece in half. Now, looking at it first, I've got an air pocket kind of going through the, the middle seam right here. So, take my clay, smash it on my board, take another bit of clay, smash it right on top, and you have two basic styles to, to, for wedging. Number one is the ram's head piece where you're pushing clay directly out, rolling it back on itself, and pushing it out again. And as you keep doing this, and you're pushing the clay out, it starts to create these two channels on either side that make looks like ram's horns. All right, so push, rotate, push, rotate. I need like some bread. Makes me feel like PETA, Hunger Games. Then cut it, check. Ooh, look, no holes this time. Uh, one thing I do want you to notice is if you have any strange pieces in your clay, such as this little bit of plaster, pull it out, put it off to the side. Uh, that should go into the trash can. Do not recycle that again. Uh, just because that, when you start using it on the wheel, will actually tear. Uh, when the clay's spinning around, it'll cause a tear into the piece and it just won't work out well. So take it and smash it again. All right, so this technique, is called the chrysanthemum technique. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm, as I'm rolling on one side, I'm pushing downward on the other side and using this hand to kind of block it. So it'll go in sort of a triangle shape. Now, the reason it's called chrysanthemum is because as I'm pushing and rotating around, I have this nice cone on one side, and on the other side, a nice spiral. It looks like a chrysanthemum flower. So, rotate it around. I like to dock it on the side a little bit. So this is ready to go onto the wheel head. Now, uh, this has also been known to be called an elephant's butt. Make sure that you have a flat surface on here, not these little bitty uh, rims. What I would do is I'd probably wedge this one more time, just to make sure it's completely flat, just because uh, when you start to throw it on the wheel, as the centrifugal force will bring it up, these pieces down here can cause water to seep in and unlock it from the wheel head once you started throwing. So try and get it as smooth as possible. Welcome back class to a wonderful exciting world of clay. Alright, so what are we up to now? Well, we're up to the second stage. So, first stage, you got your pieces, they've gone into the kiln and they fired the first time around so you'll come out with the bisque wear. Uh, so that, remember the bisque is the first firing, takes out all the physical water out of the piece uh, to where you're at the second stage where you can start glazing the pieces and you don't have to worry about too, uh, the wet glaze going on to a uh, bone dry piece, cracking, all that nasty bits like that. Uh, I'm going to set this off to the side. Now, on the next stage, you can, you're going to paint, and when I say paint, I'm using that as a really loose definition, uh, your design work onto your clay pieces themselves. So, I'm working on a halo cup right here, got Master Chief. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm applying different colors of glaze to the exterior of the piece to go in for the next firing. So this second firing, uh, the bisque firing takes out all the chemical and physical water out of the clay so that I can add water to it. I could dump this whole glass of water on top of this piece. It's not going to do anything because all the water's already been baked out of it. So it's going to be perfectly fine. Uh, but the second t firing that we're going to do is take it to full vitrification. Vitrification is where the clay has take, been taken to the most mature state that it's supposed to go to. All right, this is a low fire clay, it goes up to 04, 06. So it is fully vitrified at cone 04, whereas the 
butter clay, the high-end clay, the high-fire clay, that has to go to at least a cone 6. It can go up to a cone 10, uh, which is uh, about 2,500 degrees, but my kiln doesn't go that high. It only goes to 6. I know. Uh, so that clay is getting fully vitrified. Now, I'll take you guys in the kiln room and I can show you the kiln. All right, so for the glaze pieces themselves, uh, get yourself a paintbrush because you're going to need one of these. Uh, make sure that you're using the correct paint brushes. You're not using the paint classes paint brushes, but you're using the clay class paint brushes. Uh, the main reason is because we're dealing with a lot of chemicals. I don't want to overlap chemicals in, in a couple different classes because it will destroy the brushes faster. Uh, for one thing, if you're mixing all those chemicals, it starts to eat away at the brushes themselves. Uh, but two, I just want to make sure that the glaze doesn't get into paint and then paint doesn't get into glaze. That's kind of the big reason uh, because you never know what chemicals are in the paint that are going to mess up your glaze. So right here I've got a nice black, but if I took a bunch of yellow paint and put it in here, the color wouldn't be so hot, but then the cadmium or the, um, the chromium oxides that are used to make that color are changing the chemical composition inside this glaze. That's kind of why I don't want to mix and match them. That's the big reason. All right, so take my brush. I'm going to use a different color. Uh, I'm going to rinse that brush out in my glass. So that's why I've got the glasses right next to me. Got some water. Now, here's the thing about water with clay. I don't want to pour this down the sink because it's got all this uh, silica and alumina water, which uh, all that stuff is used to make clay. Now because I've got all these chemicals floating in here, I don't want to dump those down the sink for a couple reasons. Number one, I don't want to pollute the water table. This is going straight back into the water table as it goes down the sink, gets into the water supply, it's got all these chemicals. It's a lot harder for the county to take out of the water, so it's a safety thing for one. Two, we can't make the fun mystery glaze, uh, which is why I got a bucket for them over here, and I'll try and move it delicately so you guys can see. We take all of our clay water and dump it in here that we've used for glazes, so as the water settles and separates, all those chemicals go to the bottom, get a little bit of hydro on the top, take the water off the top, got the chemicals at the bottom, mix them up, and paint your piece, and it's that cool, funky tie-dye color. Uh, we don't know what color it's going to be because we're mixing a little bit of red, a little bit of blue, a little bit of yellow. Is it going to make all those colors? together no because they're chemicals so it's gonna make something we don't know what it's gonna do so each day it's slightly different try and use that to your advantage because it just makes a more interesting kind of piece all right so a couple things you need to know about glaze all right number one if it says L U G or has a G in there or it says the word gloss on it it's gonna be nice and shiny if it doesn't say gloss go ahead and anticipate it's gonna be a matte finish which is a dull sheen flat there is no life, there is no uh, that sparkly finish on the outside of it. Next thing we have over here is these little bottles. These little bottles are underglaze. The underglaze is so that you can do a lot of detail, experimental drawing. You can kind of paint little pictures on there with this stuff. Uh, right here I have a terracotta color. So it's going to come out that orangey reddish uh, tone, which looks really cool if you're doing like a Greek influence piece. And what you'll do is you'll paint this on the cup right here let's say I want to put some stuff on the side of it like so and then I'll take a gloss uh, transparent glaze or clear glaze and put it over the top so that way I have a top coat over it to make sure that that design work that I did underneath stays doesn't move uh, and then the top coat the transparent glaze that's on top of it also works as not only a protect and a seal but it can be that shine or another or again it could be a matte finish so everything looks flat or it could be nice and high shiny uh, such as they could be high shiny like our little minion people that we got over here so they got this nice uh, shiny exterior where it's that lemon glaze, it was, a high, it was a gloss glaze, so it gives it that nice shiny look to it. Uh, and then a brown metallic for the uh, little goggle pieces that they're wearing, just gives it that nice extra finish. Alright, so one other thing to discuss is, notice how there's a little bit of imperfection, let's say it's imperfection, where around the eye socket here, it's flat. There's not a lot of detail to it, there wasn't a lot of glaze. Well, we know this is a low fire glaze piece. We can then add low fire glaze on top of it, refire it, and it'll just add another level to it. Now the big thing is not confusing the low fire with our high fire gear. Because if I put this stuff in at the same time and set it at a cone six, which is a high fire, this will melt completely to the kiln shelf, which is a big problem. Uh, and speaking of melting, let's talk about how we put glaze on. When we put glaze on, you can take it down to the foot 
or the rim down here. Try and give yourself a little bit of space just in case because if it's too thick and that glaze starts to doesn't go past the foot of the piece because if it weld if it comes down the foot I will have to smash your piece off of my kiln shelf so the kiln shelf has some kiln wash on it to protect the shelf but if the glaze is too thick it'll melt and as it melts it'll start to fall down and attach itself to the shelf to which then I have to smash your piece off and chisel off any of the excess glaze that's attached itself to the kiln to, to the kiln itself so Make sure that all of the bottoms of the pieces are nice and clean. There's no glaze on them. So what I always do just as a precautionary thing, make sure you glaze up around the rim, take a, take a sponge, wipe it clean, and then wipe a little bit around it as well. You won't necessarily see it, but it'll ensure that the piece doesn't get smashed uh, and get stuck to the kiln shelf. All right, so the next thing we gotta talk about is some slip trails. All right, so uh, slip trailing is where you have, I like my little, squeezy bottle uh, it's just a little nose sucker thingy for infants uh, and what I'll do is I'll just take some glaze pour the glaze into it has a little stop uh, just hold your finger over it while you're pouring it in and I can use it to trail a design onto a, onto a plate or onto a tile to create a interesting bit of work and slip trailing as a design technique is just another thing that you can do instead of just taking a paintbrush dip it in paint with it makes a little more interesting thing. All right, so I'm gonna take you guys back to the kiln, take a look at it, go over a couple things on it, uh, and hopefully you don't have any questions. If so, make sure you put comments in the below section. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to the, to the, uh, to the show, and also to the channel. Uh, it just helps out the channel, helps out me, helps out do some cool stuff. Thanks. Hi. All right, class, so the other couple things we do need to touch base on real quick is when you're working on pieces, you have two different types of pieces that you're going to be working on. Either it will be a hand-built piece, which is like a little money doll right here that we got going on. Uh, lots of crazy hair, slab technique, pinch technique, coil technique, all those things fall under hand building. The other thing is a wheel thrown piece, and the, this you build with your hands. This, you have to build on the wheel. So that's the big difference between those two. Okay, and one other technique t that we do need to discuss that we haven't had a chance to yet is burnishing. Uh, here I have a simple spoon and a leather hard piece, or supposed to be leather hard, this one's bone dry. Now, what you're gonna be doing for a burnishing piece is you take your piece, you take a spoon, and you start working it in small little circles. You burnish those sections together. What I'm doing is I'm making all the plates of clay that are in there still start to lay flat and stack and compress upon each other. This is gonna give me a slot smoother finish. It's gonna make a smoother texture uh, that I don't necessarily have to glaze. Uh, one of the burnishing techniques are you'll do several burnishing passes and then put it in the kiln and when it comes out of the kiln it's already finished. You don't have to glaze it at all. Um, I'm kind of 50-50 on it personally because glaze has its place and it, there's a lot of benefits to doing glaze and there's a lot of benefits to doing a burnished piece too. The clay body that these come out as and that nice white pristine look might be the look that you're going for so if you want to keep this and not really have to do a secondary step, burnishing might be the way to go. Me personally, I look at this as blank canvas and I want to decorate it and do a whole bunch of fun stuff to it. So burnishing, eh, not my thing personally. But if that's something you want to take on, by all means, go for it, class. Hey, did you, uh, did you like the video? If so, make sure that you like, subscribe, maybe throw a comment down. Love to hear from uh, all my classmates. So let me see what you got. Alright, so the final thing we do need to talk about as far as clay stuff is that you need to know is this big shiny thing. This thing right here. This is the kiln. The kiln is where we bake all of our ceramic goodies. Alright, so in the kiln right now, I love, I love this one because this has this cool digital uh, thermostat on it. And right now my kiln is sitting about 1,325 degrees. This one I'm taking up to a cone 6, which is going to take me about to almost 2,300. It's in that 22 and a half range. Uh, but <clears throat> slowly starting to climb. Now, on this side over here, I've got some vent plugs. Now, this is plugging up some vent holes that I can do a couple different tests on. Now, 
the one test that is most kind of the consistent test for everybody is the burn test. And what I like to do the burn test for is if you don't have a digital readout on the side and you want to know if the kiln is too hot to take the lid off of, you grab some. All you have to do is grab a little piece of paper. Now, take a little paper, roll it up into a stick. Voila. Now, once you have your stick, the thing that you need to know is this. Paper burns at about 450 degrees. A lighter will, will ignite at 500 degrees. If you hold up a kiln barometer, which is this thing, a special little tool, tells you how what the readout is of the kiln, uh, tells you how hot everything is, all kind of fun stuff. The If you hold the end of it into a lighter, it only register about 500 degrees. This is almost three times that at this point. So it's super duper hot. So I'm gonna take my little bit of paper and safety, put on my welder's gloves. Now the welder's gloves are gonna protect me from when I take the plug off to do a burn test, I don't burn my fingertips. Now why would you gonna why would you need to do a burn test? Well, if you don't have a digital readout, and this is going back to what I said a second ago. If you don't have a digital readout, and you don't want to open this up because right now if I was if I were to open it up I have 60 degrees uh, temperature in here where this is, my room is really cold <clears throat> I open it up all that cold air goes inside of it all of the mortar that's holding those bricks together shatters and hits me in the face that could kill me which I don't want to do so to protect myself I'm going to take out one of the plugs stick the paper into it to see how fast it starts to burn now if your paper burn, burns paper burns at 450 degrees. If I take a piece of paper, put it in the vent hole, and it just starts to char a little bit, starts to get a little bit of brown to it, that tells me that the kiln itself is lower to 300 degrees or less. And now why do I need to know that? I need to know that because then I know when I can take the lid, open the lid up to take the wear out without burning my fingertips or injuring the kiln, which then injures me, which is a big problem because that's a lot of money to fix things. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take out one of these pegs and if I turn the lights off this, uh, well it's not going to glow yet, it has to get a lot hotter than that. <clears throat> I take my paper and I can stick it into the edge like so, and it's on fire. So that is how you do a burn test. You just stick it in, test it a little bit. Now. Take my vent. I gotta plug this back up because of what the fire I'm working on. So, when you're doing a test, when you're doing a kiln run, you want to make sure that your kiln is not so hot that you can't work into it. There you go. Cool. Because otherwise, this becomes a big safety concern. So, FYI, make sure that you don't make it so hot to where you can't touch it. All right. Also, I have to say this because this happened one time. This is super hot. Right now, it's saying 1341. If I was to touch the outside of the kiln, I would burn myself. Why do I have to say that? Because somebody touched the outside of the kiln and I kind of told them not to, and then they said, ow, it's hot. Things to think about. Hey class, I hope that you liked that last video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe down there at the bottom. Now I'm going to get back to uh, doing my thing, which is uh, working on my own stuff. So uh, don't forget to follow me on the web. I got a bunch of places you can find me, such as Pinterest. Or t no, not, not, we're not doing Tumblr. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, GroupMe. That's a new one for me. And Steam. Uh, and my personal favorite, YouTube. Check me out, like and subscribe. See you guys later, next class. Follow, see you later, next class, do your homework.